Chapter 64 The Desolation and the Tree Lydia rallied her team around her as they watched the wolves leave. We're heading towards this tree that Freddy found, she announced. That means walking across that wasteland. I don't think it will be long until we meet the Watcher for real. Most of you have met him in your dreams. We might as well keep our wands out and ready. We need to defend ourselves. He's going to know where we are. We shall not hide our magic any more. She looked at the faces around her and smiled a grim smile. I'm proud to have had you all by me, she continued. You never really knew what you'd agree to when you came. Neither did I. You've been through the lot without complaint. Now is the time to decide whether you want to go on. I have no right to command you against your will. Anyone who wants to leave can do so with my blessing. None of them said anything. Quinn, she addressed the wanderer, I assume you will return to your life and wait for the next quest. You will look after anyone who wants to stay, won't you? I would take any and all who wish to remain, Quinn said, if that is your wish. Anyone? Lydia asked. Most looked at their friends. Many shook their heads. None offered to leave. Shona? Lydia asked. We'll have to fight and kill, I guess. I wasn't expecting a picnic, Shona assured her. I'm staying with my friends. What about you, Dev? She asked him. You've never wanted to be a warrior. Well, I shouldn't dismiss it as a career choice without giving it a fair trial, Dev reasoned. Count me in. Freddy? Lydia continued. Oh, like you could manage without me, Freddy grinned. You'll be reprobate, said Xander. That's my line and you know it. As if a bunch of humans could manage without their cat. So I am staying by you. Never here has got any sense, then. Lydia summed up. Well, it's if we had, Corbin explained. We'd never have set out. Let's kick this watcher's ass and go home. A hubbub of agreement ran around the group. OK, Lydia said in conclusion. Say your farewells to Quinn, and we'll go to find the tree. The companions said goodbye to Quinn. Freddy cried. Quinn waved a last wave and wandered back into the forest. He did not turn around again. Lydia hugged Freddy, and they set off across the wasteland. Lydia couldn't help being reminded of the entrance to the ante world, where the Watcher had sent them so many trials. She had seen more of that blasted landscape than the others, because of her enhanced senses. They seemed to have deserted her now. The mist had thickened while they had taken their leave of Quinn. It blanketed the desolate land. Droplets of moisture stuck to their clothes and skin as they marched onto the plain. What features there were, a lifeless pond here, a stunted bush there, solidified out of the fog as they approached. The ground underfoot was grey and parched, despite the mist, with little vegetation. It looked choked with ash. Lydia wondered what horrors in its history had left it like this. They were far enough into the wasteland that they could no longer see the forest behind. There was no glimpse of what might be on either side. They slouched on, hunched and silent. From the distance an ululating howl came to them. They couldn't be sure of the direction. Other unfamiliar bestial calls answered. There was a sighing as of a breeze, but no breath stirred the veils of mist. Lydia's senses could not penetrate the vapour. This distressed her. It was a last sign that her powers, her only advantage, had deserted her. She strode on giving no sign to her companions. What had to be done, she could only do with their help, their company. She must not let their resolve drift away on the shreds of mist that swirled around them as they moved. She thought not to let hers do so. The airs grew thicker and darker. More noises came to them, borne on the languid air. Slithering, snuffling, writhing. Small sounds which must be closer but still beyond their misted sight. The fog was close about them, cutting them off from the rest of this world. The ante world might be a construct, an imagining, as they had been told, but it had felt real. It had become their reality, their new home. They were separated from it now, 
in a place which seemed less real than one of the watcher's dreams. Overhead a shadow passed in a rush of noise. Instinct made them duck their heads. What's that? Joan asked. Something to keep us unsettled, Lydia said. If it's going to attack, it would have. It wouldn't have announced its presence. The watcher wants to play. Like that Aloria you were talking about, Corbin asked. Yeah. I didn't understand at the time. It wasn't just for fun. It's to test for weaknesses and put us off balance. That way we're more likely to make mistakes. Also more enjoyable for them, if they're that way inclined, said Corbin. Thinking of some of my dorm mates. From the ship, it looked like a swooping eel, said Dev. Larger than usual, though. They eat brains, don't they? Dean asked. And the jokes just write themselves, Jimmy said. Stay on guard, and don't let it get to you, Lydia advised. If it makes a noise, it's not attacking you. Unless it's a munching noise, Dean suggested. Let's all think happy thoughts, Freddy said. I love you, Freddy, Sophie said. So shut up now. They moved on. The fog was darker still. There was a strange, rotten smell, woven into the mist. It was somewhere between a butcher's shop and an open sewer. Lydia thought of Inferi. It cheered her somehow. Inferi were easy to deal with. Plenty of fire would soon rid you of them. Her old magic may have deserted her, but she could feel that her high magic was stronger than ever. Another shadow swooped over them. They ducked again. After an age of trudging, swooping and ducking, Lydia noticed something. Can anyone make that out? she asked in a subdued tone. Is that a shadow ahead? I can't tell if my eyes are playing tricks. I think there is something, Christy said. Like a faint shape. They plodded onward. The shape began to resolve itself. There was something there. It was the shape of a tree, but vague, spectral, less solid than the mere mist should have made it. It's the tree, Lydia realised. But there are no leaves. That's why it looks so faint. They hurried forward until they could see it clearly. It towered over them. The branches reached over their heads now, yet the trunk was still some way off. The poor tree, Freddy lamented. It was so lively and lush in the mandala. And what happened to it? Lydia felt a sickening surge inside. Maybe we forgot to look after it. The party wandered here and there under the canopy of branches. Heads tilted upwards, taking in the sheer architectural splendour of the tree. It was a cathedral of a tree, yet a ruin. Its desolation weighed on their hearts. Look! Freddy cried, pointing upwards. Lydia followed the line of his arm. He was right. There was something to see. There was a haze of green among an area of the branches. What is it? Sophie asked. Hope, said Freddy. He ran forward to the trunk of the tree and laid his head and his hands on one of its monumental buttresses. We'll help, tree, he addressed it. We'll save you. No. You will join it in death, said a voice like a tomb opening. The companions turned to see a different mist. It was black and grainy. It swirled around itself, forming a column. The centre of the swelling vapour condensed into a form. It was that of a tall man in a hooded cloak. Lydia glared into his gaunt grey face with its sunken eyes and wispy beard. She could look at him without fear. In another world far away and long ago, Lydia had issued the challenge, and now had no reason to avoid his gaze. Watcher, said Lydia, what brings you here? Your destruction, he said. Here the wall between worlds is thin. I will wipe you away, then destroy your world. He swept an arm through the air. The air shimmered, blurring their vision. When it settled, the tree had gone, replaced by a castle. The castle was a ruin, just walls with no roof. Lydia shuddered. They were still in the wasteland. The only thing the Grey Watcher had transformed was the tree. 
The Watcher raised his hand towards Lydia. Christy shot a shield charm between Lydia and the Watcher, followed a fraction later by Sophie's shield. The Watcher staggered back a step. The air crackled as the companions directed a volley of spells at the Watcher, forcing him backwards. Lydia's team spread out to either side, hitting the Watcher again and again from all angles. He hissed, and, with a sweep of his hand, threw up a shimmering shield of magical force. Foolish children, he snarled. Now you fall to my army. He turned his back to them, safe behind his protective spell, and lifted his spread hands. A wind blew, and his cloak billowed around him. Tattered shreds of mist fled on the gale, pushed back to the edges of the wasteland. The ground before the Grey Watcher cracked, spurts of dust rising from the dry earth where it broke apart. He disappeared in a whirlwind of dark, greeny mist. Stick together, everyone, Lydia called out. Where's Sander? Sophie asked. The rest of the team looked at each other. None of them had him. He was walking alongside me when we entered the wasteland, Christy said. I've not seen him since. We've other priorities right now. Lydia said, pointing. From the cracked ground, skeletal figures were rising, shaking the ashen dust from their limbs. Some were on two legs, others on four. Fight like your lives depend on it, Dean shouted. Because, you know. Watch the flanks, Lydia warned, pointing to either side. Dean, check behind the ruins. The rest of you out on fire. The Inferi were warriors, bearing swords and axes. They charged towards the companions with a rattle of dry cries and a clatter of weapons. The witches and wizards blasted wave upon wave of them, only to have them replaced by more. The four-legged figures wore ragged pelts, but were recognisable as wolves, as they gathered in packs. There's more of them, Dean bellowed. They're all around us. Spread out! Circle round the ruin! Lydia ordered. The group dispersed around the castle, each in sight of those nearest them. They continued to strike down the Inferi with every spell they could remember. For now the packs of wolves held back, prowling around behind the ranks of warriors. Dev ran around the ruin, checking on how the others were faring, and helping where he could. He ran back to Lydia. We are holding them now, Dev called to her. But if the Watcher can keep sending his army at us, or if the wolves attack... Suggestions? Lydia asked. You must call on the forest for help, he said. Yeah, I've been doing that. Whatever it sends, we'll have to get here first. Let us hope we are alive when it arrives, Dev remarked. Go to her, Dev. Help her. Help Shona, Lydia said. Dev stared at her for a second, then ran. Lydia looked out over what had become a battlefield. It was hard to see what was coming now. The wall of fallen Inferi was high enough to block her sight. We're closer to the altar world than we've ever been, Lydia said to herself. Closer to the source of high magic. Let's see what this wand Ambrose made me can do. With a sweep of her wand, she blasted the wall of Inferi corpses with fire. Blue-white flames rose into the sky, consuming the bodies. With her eyes closed, she guided the flames around the ring of fallen bodies which encircled the ruin. In seconds, the wall was gone, burned away without ash or any sign it had been there. Rows of Inferi had cowered while the bright fire raged. Now they charged. The packs of ragged wolves beyond gathered into an army of their own in the space behind where the Inferi rose. Gathering her strength, Lydia cast spells to force the Inferi back pushing them back into the broken ground which had spawned them. It worked, but the Inferi surfaced again, along with those still rising. The spells had given her team a moment's respite, but achieved nothing other than to spur the wolves into action. The wolves had congregated on Lydia's side of the castle. It was odd behaviour for wolves, both to gather in such numbers and to attack from one direction. The Watcher must be controlling them, aiming a spearhead attack to break through their circle. If the wolves got in between her friends and attacked from all sides, Lydia prepared to strike against the wolves' assault. The wolves feared fire, as did the Inferi, but fire was only a temporary help. She needed to make it last longer. 
Above, the sky filled with dark shapes. They looked like manta rays, had spiked wings, and heads resembling those of the chupacabras they had fought. They were the swooping evil, the shadows which had passed over them on the way to the noble tree. Lydia aimed her wand to send wave after wave of blasting curses at the flying creatures. The others continued their volley of spells at the inferi and wolves on the battlefield. Every time Lydia looked down to see how the ground battle was faring, their airborne attackers swooped in closer, snapping at the students with snarling jaws. Lydia heard a howling. It was further away than the reanimated wolves. And she recognised the tone. Emerging from the mist beyond the battlefield came scores of wolves, her own in the vanguard. Not only had they returned, they had brought others with them. The others were ordinary wolf size, similar to the wolf in Firai. But something else was happening. A ball of fire, a creature of flame, sprang out from among her wolf pack. It led a charge at the Inferi wolves. The ragged wolves and the Inferi soldiers became trapped between a desire to attack the young witch and a need to face this fresh assault, caught between the watcher's command and the ghost of their instincts. Lydia and her friends continued to throw back and burn the Inferi, but Lydia kept checking on the wolves. Whatever the creature of flame was, it was striking through the watcher's ragged beasts. It ran from side to side through their packs, casting them into turmoil and tossing their bodies aside like rags. Then it turned towards Lydia and ploughed a furrow through the Inferi, Lydia's wolves following on behind. As it approached, she could make out its shape. It was a tiger, striped and haloed in fire, as tall as a room, taller than the wolves and carrying a star on its forehead. Then she understood. She fell to her knees as she recognised him, struck down by her love for him. Thunder! she cried, 